thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Alec. Uh, I think maybe more of you probably know my co-presenter here, Wukash. Uh, and as he said, we're from the Android malware research team at Google. Uh, so yeah, so we're here today to talk to you about OTAs, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more what those are if you're not familiar. But basically, they're the system updaters on Android devices. Um, so for the past couple of years, Wukash and I have been primarily kind of focusing on pre-installed uh, security threats on Android devices. Um, so we're taking a look at like the device firmware and all the system apps and everything else that comes uh, pre-installed on a device out of the box. Because um, unfortunately, a lot of times there still is malware uh, in this space. So we'll talk today about some uh, examples, uh, some case studies, including you know, why is this actually a target and uh, what is Google doing about it? So just to give a little bit of background first on uh, the whole space that we're talking about here and where OTAs fit in, uh, the supply chain for Android can get kind of complicated. Part of this is because there's just a lot of different devices that might run Android. You know, uh, Most people might think of it as a phone operating system, but it's also used uh, for cars, for televisions, tablets, and a million other different IoT devices. Uh, so in the production of any one device, uh, there's gonna be a lot of different companies involved. Um, and the boundaries between these companies that you might see here in this chart get blurred a lot. So uh, for example, you might think of MediaTek as a you know, chipset producer, but for Android devices, a lot of times they might even make things like you know, music or media players or messaging apps. Um, sometimes some devices are just a relicensing of a, a device that already existed from another company. Um, and depending on different use cases, the company might not have a lot of expertise in that domain. So they might uh, contract out certain parts of the device, um, one of those things being OTAs. So OTA just stands for over the air. Uh, it's over the air updates. So basically the system update when a new version of the operating system or when new uh, versions of applications, security patches, things like that. Uh, you know, probably that button that you're always clicking ignore because you don't want to restart your device. I know I do it sometimes, I'm guilty of it. <laughs> But on Android, uh, this process is actually uh, pretty straightforward for developers to implement. All it requires is just downloading the new system image that you want to install on the device. And then there is a single API call um, in the recovery system API that actually verifies the signature, installs it, and then you reboot the device. Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, one reason it cannot be straightforward though is as a device manufacturer, there might be a lot of customization you wanna do in this space. So if you have a pre-installed app, you might want to update it out of band. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense that every time you wanna update your settings app, you have to do a full system update and reboot the device, right? Maybe you wanna do just update that one app or maybe you wanna update uh, some system properties or, uh, you know, change the server that it connects to, just small changes. Um, some other things that might cause complications are, uh, you, know, you know, where you're actually gonna host these big uh, files for download. Maybe it's something that's too expensive for you. So that's uh, kind of why these end up being a target for abuse, is that they're frequently contracted out to other companies um, other companies will develop these whole tools that allow you to manage you know, which devices are gonna get updates, when they get updates, depending on a variety of factors like region, mobile carrier, things like that. Um, another reason that they're a main target for abuse is that they're very privileged apps on the device. So they uh, automatically are expected to have access to a lot of sensitive permissions, and they run as a more privileged user on the device usually. So they actually run with this shared user ID, uh, which is basically like running as a privileged Linux user that, run, that uh, the rest of the operating system runs as, uh, the Android system user. And it gets access to a whole variety of extra permissions that user space or user installed apps don't usually have access to, and uh, as well as a bunch of other APIs. Um, 
In addition, this, these are apps that you would expect to be downloading other applications. So if you're looking at your device and you see that this you know, system updater app is installing other applications on your device, that's not immediately suspicious. Um, so it's a great opportunity for someone who wants to sell access to your device, download a bunch of malware, to just kind of slip things in occasionally. Uh, so we end up seeing sometimes OTAs will do just that. They'll sell access to devices, create a botnet, start downloading you know, ad fraud modules, and just running them whenever they feel like it. So the first instance we'll talk about is uh, DigiTime. Uh, so this is something that has been discussed by others already externally. Um, I think it first made headlines uh, with a Malware Bytes article um, that was specifically talking about uh, some budget phones that were uh, being distributed by a program through the US government um, in a, with a company called Assurance Wireless. Um, some more technical details were also posted on this blog, which there's a link to here. Uh, I'll talk about all that information that's already public, but in addition, today we're gonna talk about uh, some other things that haven't really been published yet, like what were the apps that they were actually downloading, and then uh, other versions uh, after they realized that they've been detected. So the initial version uh, was being distributed on a variety of Android devices. I think it was ended up, uh, they had like a few dozen customers in the Android space, uh, OEMs and carriers and things like that, um, where Digitime was the standard OTA or system update provider. Uh, the actual application looked pretty basic. Uh, it just did like the basic system update, you know, it was a pretty small application, but there was like two lines in the Java code that launched a Lua interpreter and the Lua interpreter uh, had a Java to Lua interface. And so if you looked in the asset files that were included in the application, there were these two files called license one and license three that were actually compiled Lua code. And they contained this whole uh, command and control module that would connect to a server and uh, do things like it could check in and update itself, uh, it would um, also have the ability to download other modules in Lua and execute them. And uh, it would just basically repeatedly check in over and over again, self-update, and uh, all this Lua code was running with the elevated permissions of this system application. Uh, so when you take a look at how it was communicating with the back end, the first thing it would do is just check in, you know, identify itself as uh, a new user device, and uh, download an update to the Lua code. Uh, and so you can see all the URLs that they would use here for their backend servers um, were all things that looked kind of like they could be legitimate. Um, my favorite one here is androidsecurityteam.club. I don't know who they thought they were fooling there. <laughs> uh, and I also thought this was interesting because it's not something I'd normally see in Android malware where they're trying to blend traffic in. Um, normally, you would just see them using one URL, and when it gets burned, they just throw in another one. But these applications were actually uh, really frequently updating their command and control servers, um, sometimes using multiple at a time. Uh, and so I just thought that was something I normally seen you know, more with like Windows or Linux malware, not, not very typical. Um, one of the things that it would in initially update with once it was convinced that you, know, you weren't uh, an emulator was that uh, it would run these modules that allowed them to launch applications by specifying the, uh, the actual component name that it wanted to launch. So it could launch an activity in another Android app or a service or um, send something to a broadcast receiver. So the, uh, the applications that they were downloading were frequently uh, these applications that actually had no user interface, they were only able to be launched uh, automatically by these OTA applications. So they would frequently contain code from families that we've seen uh, you know, on Play Store or um, through other side-loaded uh, user space applications. 
Um, some, other, some of the families we noticed uh, that we've talked about before were things like snow fox and chamois. Um, but in this case, they would just take those SDKs, put them in a custom application that uh, the user would never even see. It didn't have uh, anything user facing, um, but they all had these uh, service or activity names um, that were all formatted the same way. So you could, you could tell that these applications were all being distributed by the same person. And so when you take a look at the code, some of the, the things that they would normally be doing would be like clicking on applications, showing visible ads, uh, also doing uh, install refer fraud, basically trying to take credit for when an application was installed, um, even if they weren't the one who actually downloaded it. Another uh, interesting thing that kind of came along as a side effect of this whole campaign was that OEM started introducing new framework code into the Android operating system uh, on their builds. And so they added uh, a system service uh, that could be called by applications that did all these uh, privileged API calls. And normally these are all things that would be guarded by sensitive permissions and are only ac accessible by pre-installed system applications. But in this case, any app could call them, including the apps that they were downloading without requesting any of those custom permissions. Uh, so this included things like the ability to install and uninstall other applications. Um, you could uh, automatically grant all the permissions that they were requesting. Uh, you could um, enable uh, individual components of an application or uh, disable applications altogether um, and do things like uh, access uh, all of the system files that were written onto the device. Uh, so we actually ended up reporting this as a vulnerability um, and disclosing this publicly. So you can go to the link here and find more details about it. Uh, and another thing that was interesting about this was that we started seeing this system service on applications that weren't even using the DigiTime OTA. So some OEMs were introducing this higher up in their source code and then it just ended up being on all their devices. So this system service ended up being on, you know, like a few hundred uh, different device models, um, probably about four or five times more device models than we're actually using the DigiTime OTA. Uh, once they noticed that we were actually detecting them, they uh, updated their whole framework to add a bunch of anti-analysis, a bunch of debugging and unpacking. So uh, whereas before they just had this Lua framework that was packaged into the class, that was all moved out of the application and elsewhere into the operating system. So now the new applications would just call to a custom uh, Android Java API that was in the framework code. That would call over JNI to uh, a native library that was stored somewhere on the device. Usually they'd piggyback on something that was already existing, so it would be something like a MediaTek or a Qualcomm library, and they would add in some uh, JNI methods in there. And then that would do probably the most uh, emulator detection I've ever seen in one application or in one malware sample. Uh, it checked for basically everything that you can find anywhere on GitHub or on the internet, and any you know blog post, checking all the different possible system properties, checking the chipset, uh, checking uh, for things like Frida or Exposed, um, checking for VirtualBox, basically doing anything they could possibly check to see is this a real device or not. Uh, once they were satisfied, finally they would actually unpack some encrypted DEX file from, uh, from this library and they would actually save it to the cache, the DEX execute, or the Java executable cache on the device. Um, so something that's not even normally accessible to apps. And then finally, that from would decrypt and execute the original Lua code that we saw. So they would generate this key, and then, sorry, generate this key, and then do XOR decryption of uh, the Lua code and end up executing the same package that we saw before. 
Um, so this was interesting because we actually reached out to DigiTime originally for the first version, and the answer we got was, oh, this is actually a module for our customers, so any apps that you're seeing are being downloaded by the OEMs, which obviously was not true because all the apps uh, were the same across all devices, and the OEMs had no knowledge of this. Um, but for some reason, people kept partnering with them and uh, went on to keep using this next version of this app. But uh, I think so far, we have not seen a version three. So, okay. <laughs> I'll pass it over to Wukash to talk about the second case study. Thanks. Um, I'm slowly losing my voice, so think of it as a built-in uh, talk ending point when I lose my voice completely. But um, uh, I will talk about the second OTA app that uh, is not connected to the first case study at all. It's just, uh, it was built for the same purpose, but uh, by a completely different company and using completely different methods. So um, this one, for this one, we only had one external report that we are aware of. Uh, this was by Malwarebytes. Um, and uh, it dealt with some mobile phones in Germany specifically that had a pre-installed auto-installer. They call it an auto-installer, but it's a part of the OTA app. So uh, again, same story. There's the OTA path that updates the system image, and that's fairly straightforward and clear, and um, it's handled by the Android operating system. But there's additional functionality that uh, downloads apps both updates and malware. Uh, and in this case, the Malware Bytes blog post uh, presented just one case. We were able to find three different versions, so I will talk about three different versions of the same, uh, of the same malware. So the first version, uh, it had an ad framework and a dropper. By that I mean that the ad framework was built into the OTA app. It wasn't dropped, but it also had the ability to uh, drop other apps and uh, install even, even more stuff. So you can see that there is a really weird file in assets called uh, imp default 4.0 for 10. Um, and this is the default jar file that will have that add framework and also with the functionality of a dropper. Um, so this was loaded and then it had methods to download more decks, code, download jars, uh, install apps, but also display ads. Um, so it was fairly self-contained. Um, apart from that, it had the update functionality, so it could update itself, uh, obviously, to a newer version. Um, so fairly basic, and you can see that the method names are, um, well, self-describing, really. I didn't change the names, uh, so this is, these are the names that uh, they've used when they um, compiled this DEX file. The features were kind of interesting. So the first feature was that they have a very opportunistic use of SU. So they didn't try to root the phone. They didn't have exploits. They didn't install SU. If SU was there, so if you had your phone rooted and you had an SU binary, they would use it, but they wouldn't try to do it themselves. So you can see there are two paths on the right-hand side. One is the regular path that uh, installs an app, so it will trigger a regular install flow. Uh, and user would be aware of that, so it wasn't very fancy in that way. Um, but if, if it found the SU binary, there is a second path that you can see it just uh, invokes PM install. So if the phone is rooted and has the SU binary, user won't see the install happening. Uh, another interesting feature was a complete lack of TLS validation. So they connected over HTTPS or TLS, uh, and they didn't validate the, um, the, the server certificate in any way. So you could just connect to any other server uh, and intercept the traffic. Uh, it didn't have to be signed by a known CA or anything like that. Um, which is fairly interesting, but it's also a fairly um, common mistake that some developers do, that they don't bother to validate the certificate when they connect to over TLS. So then uh, when we started detecting V1, uh, same with Digitime, uh, they uh, noticed that we were detecting them and they changed the version. The interesting thing about this particular malware is that it had three versions and all three versions are completely different. It's like they rewrote the thing from scratch, or at least I cannot find a, like very common patterns. Um, they use similar CNCs, so the, that part stays the same, but the code is like, we abandon all of it and we will write it again from scratch. 
which makes the detection very difficult and is also something that you don't often see with malware. At least they try to, you know, um, retain some of the code they already wrote to have less work, but uh, this one was just, oh, we will start again. Um, so this one had a bit more obfuscation. You can see the um, uh, class names using are using UTF characters, so it's not so easy to reference them. Um, the names are also obfuscated, so it wasn't as easy as the previous version where you could basically guess what the method is doing based on the method name. Um, and uh, the app dropper functionality also got updated, so we can now install apps using an intent. And you can see there's the package name, version, version code, download URL. So we can pass everything you want to that app, and it will do the install, the download and installation for you. Uh, again, because it's an OTA app, uh, it's supposed to install apps because it's supposed to install app updates, right? Uh, this is what you expect from an OTA app. Uh, so it's using the existing permission that it has for different reasons to install apps, to install malware uh, apps that users don't want. So uh, not only system updates, but also, uh, also malware. Um, they retained some of the features. The, the most prominent one they retained is the complete lack of validation of the TLS certificate. So this kind of stays the same uh, alongside the versions. Uh, they might have actually copied the code here, so uh, yeah, it doesn't do anything. Um, the uh, other thing they did is they encoded the CNC URLs as base64. Um, and this screenshot, all, screenshot always reminds me of uh, kind of useless knowledge that I keep in my mind, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you keep in your minds. So when you see AHR, uh, you will probably think of HTTP or HTTPS, uh, because that's how the URLs, URLs start. And it's just base64, there isn't any fancy uh, thing, so if you debase64 it, you will find the CNC address, and there are several of them so that they can use backups. Uh, interestingly, it also starts activities. So the problem with installing an app is whenever you install a new app on Android, it won't start automatically. Uh, and it has, the app itself has no way of starting automatically, at least that I'm, I'm aware of. So first time you install it, you have to click on an icon, usually that's what users do, uh, to start the app, and then the app starts itself. Uh, so uh, in, in order to install the app successfully, Redstone uh, OTA not only had to download it and install it, it, it also um, uh, was supposed to start it, so it, it got the activity name uh, for the thing it has to start. Um, and then when we started detecting V2, obviously they went, uh, they um, rewrote the whole thing again, and uh, we got V3. Uh, V3 had a custom DEX obfuscated format, or APK obfuscated format. Um, and you can see that the <coughs> class names are still uh, Unicode characters, so it's uh, difficult to, um, to um, reference them. The thing that um, really stands out, and I forgot to mention it with previous versions, but it stayed consistent uh, along all the versions, is that you have this part of the code that, is, that looks very clean, right? Has proper names and all that. That's the top part. And this is the part responsible for the OTA and for the system updates and for everything that they were supposed to do. And then you have a separate part that uh, is obfuscated and is doing the malware stuff. So, Obfuscation is good, but also when you see an app that has a clean part and the obfuscated part, your brain goes, what's the obfuscated part about, right? Why isn't it all clean code with proper function names and, uh, and class names? But they kept this scheme of having proper part, legitimate part, and having the malicious part kind of separate. Uh, obviously, there has to be some kind of an overlap, but uh, it's mostly separate. And in this case, the, the format was kind was also interesting. So it started with the magic. Uh, the magic was Cordex 1 or Cordex 2, just in ASCII. Um, and then you had the file size. Um, and then you had the XORT APK. So the obfuscation method was just XORing. And as far as I can tell, the difference between Cordex 1 and Cordex 2 was the XOR key. Um, I'm not sure if there was any other difference. And when you uh, unpacked it or deobfuscated it, 
um, then you get this um, code with classes.dex and manifest. So we got the kind of an APK file, uh, and inside of it, it was, uh, there was classes.dex. And you can see that the method names here are, uh, well, they are non-descriptive. Um, you still have a class that's named A, uh, but they don't use the same obfuscation that the code that loaded the dex used. So they don't use Unicode, they just use uh, regular um, names for that. Um, and this is what the CNC sends back. So one of the CNCs, uh, in one case, we were able to uh, get the traffic that came from the, UNC, from the CNC to the device. And you have the package name. So this is the app name that was installed. And you can see there is a bunch of apps that were installed here. Uh, then you have an action. Action is when the app has to be started. So the OTA was responsible for making the app persist on the device or run persistently, but also reinstall it when uh, the app was removed. So in most cases, you have something like user present or screen on, uh, which means that the user is kind of engaging with the phone. Uh, and that's when you start the, the main activity. It's similar to Digitime and similar to what Alex said. Um, the apps are headless. There is no... Um, user interface to speak of. Users cannot really interact with the app uh, in any way, uh, except for maybe when it displays the ads. Uh, but you wouldn't see uh, an icon or activity. Uh, this was all done programmatically. Um, so um, yeah, I just want to repeat again, there's a bunch of apps here. So it's, it's, really, um, it's really a lot. It's not, uh, it's not just one. Um, and since we're talking about the apps, the payload generally falls in the same category as with Digitime, so it will be some kind of an ad fraud, whether it's a click fraud, so clicking on the ads uh, without user interaction, um, ad spam, which means that the users will just see ads um, uh, all, all the time or, um, or very, very often. There are hidden ads. Um, these are meant to uh, can get impressions from users without actually displaying the ad to the user. So it's meant to trick the uh, advertiser to think that the ad was displayed to the user and the ad isn't displayed to the user. So it's usually like an unseen activity or uh, transparent activity. And there's also disruptive advertising. This means that when the user is doing something, it's trying to browse the internet or whatever. Whenever you have the user attention, you're going to display the ad, which is a terrible experience for users. You're just trying to, I don't know, launch a web browser, and the first thing you see is an ad. Um, and this is an example of a click fraud app that was heavily using randomization. So if you have a click fraud that tries to click on an ad without user interaction, you would usually have some kind of randomization, uh, because otherwise the server side can easily detect that the app is clicking on, uh, on, uh, on the ad. User will usually click in different places on the ad. It, the user usually won't click on the center of the ad every single time. Uh, that's just not how users click on ads. Um, so you have to use some kind of a randomization. Um, don't tell that to anyone, but users also don't randomly click on ads, uh, which when you see that uh, there are random clicks, you can, um, you can actually do something about that. Um, so um, they had really interesting tricks. Um, these are tricks from the payload. So most likely, um, even though I don't know that for sure, but uh, most likely the apps that were downloaded were written by someone else and they just uh, paid for installs, right? So it's not necessarily the same developer. Uh, and the payload apps, the apps that did uh, some kind of an ad fraud had really interesting tricks in them. So uh, the thing that you can see on the upper right, uh, it's not only an icon. This PNG file has also embedded a jar file, which is XORed using a key that's also in the PNG file. So it displays a wrench, but if you try to parse it, you can get a DEX file out of it as well. Um, this is, I guess, a method to make us not reverse engineer the app. I never understood this because the PNG file is just huge for a wrench, um, for an image of a wrench. but. Um, yeah, 
Uh, and there are counters that make sure that the ads aren't displayed too often. Um, I would like to think it's for user experience. It's probably more that the server will throttle you and detect that you're doing ad fraud if you display ads too often, right? So not single device shouldn't display in hundreds of ads per minute, right? Uh, it's, it's just not how ads work. Uh, so they make sure that they stay under the radar and are not easily detected by uh, the ad networks that they are trying to abuse. But the most interesting thing to me was the way that you were trying to get the top activity. Um, in recent Android versions, um, almost every um, uh, uh, version that, um, uh, that's, um, that was released uh, recently, um, you cannot get the top activity that's running. You cannot get the top app that users are interacting with uh, if you're not the top app itself. Um, so they will try to get it. Uh, to figure out what the user is doing so that they can display ads, right? So if the user is opening a browser, uh, they can obviously display ads because the user is trying to engage with the phone, so they know that. Um, and getting the top activity is just a thing that um, ad fraud apps trying to do, are trying to do. And the way that you are trying to circumvent that there's no API call that allows you to do that is they first started a PS command, then they diffed the list from the previous PS command, so they had to do it twice. So they were looking for a new process that was started. Then uh, they removed all the processes with names that are not starting with com dot. Um, this is to get rid of system processes, although Android packages don't always start with com dot, especially if you're not in the US or English speaking country. Um, then they had hard-coded list of uh, processes that they didn't want to see, so they removed them off the list as well. And then they get, get, got the process with the highest process ID because, uh, you know, the highest process ID means it was recently started. Um, and as a homework to all of you, you can all figure out why this goes wrong so many times in so many cases, and you cannot really get a top activity out of that. Um, but yeah, they were at least trying, um, or copied it over from the internet, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, last couple of minutes, uh, I will tell you how we are dealing with these OTA apps. So OTA apps are usually pre-installed, and the thing with OTA apps is that they have these two paths, right? So users still want to get system updates, obviously they want to get security updates and OS updates, but they don't want to get malware with it. So um, we we scan all the devices that have Google Apps before the device or an update to, the, to, the, to that device is released. They are scanned using a bunch of tests which are done either on device or on the system image. It depends on the test type. Um, and the tests are not necessarily only for security reasons, some of them are for compatibility reasons, so they are testing different things, whether the API is working correctly, whether the uh, hardware is working correctly. But the one that's uh, most interesting to us, at least, is BTS, uh, which stands for Build Test Suite, and that's the test suite that scans for malware. Um, and we scan the system images not only by scanning the apps, but we also scan the binaries and everything else that's on the system image. Um, and then when the test uh, or the scan is done, then, then the device can be launched. Um, so it has to pass all of these tests, including a test for malware. And uh, this is how we detect OTAs. So if it has the OTA that we deem to be malicious, uh, the device cannot be released and we need a second uh, system image with either a clean version of the OTA or without that uh, app uh, at all. And finally, <laughs> Some stats for you for the last calendar year. So uh, we protect over 3 billion devices. Uh, Android devices that have Google Play on them have a thing called Google Play Protect, which scans the apps uh, and uh, removes malware or asks you to remove malware. Uh, in the last calendar year, we scanned over 4 million pre-installed app apps that were on uh, over 170,000 system images. Uh, when I say system image, I mean both the update and the, um, and the first system image. Um, so this is, uh, the, these are the numbers that we're dealing with when we are trying to look for uh, malware in system images and uh, in launch devices. And we have five minutes, I believe, for questions. So thank you.
uh, my voice made it to the end. Hi, really cool presentation. Uh, I have a question about the PS trick. I know that in the latest versions of Android, you can no longer get the full process tree. Are they that dumb or I am missing something? <laughs> uh, I think they were just targeting older versions or uh, they didn't, didn't get a memo that it doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah, it never really worked anyway, so. I didn't quite get how does the DigiTime application gets on the phone in the first place. Like, is there like a legal company selling this application? And if so, how come you get a V2? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so for both of these cases, um, yeah, they're developed by, we'll say legit companies, <laughs> but basically uh, yeah, companies that the OEM or some other person in the distribution chain partners with to contract out the OTA part of the operating system. Um, so yeah, the company names were actually Digitime and Redstone. Uh, it, it just kind of seems that sometimes people add these features on the side and say, you know, we're gonna be on all these devices, we're really privileged, let's make a little money on the side. <laughs> um, basically, anytime I think we've reached out, it's, you know, a rogue developer, so. <laughs> So bu building on the last question, how many times do they get to fool you before you yank their key or revoke their signatures? So, do you mind? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, uh, the, the problem is that it's, as Alex said, these are subcontractors. They, they are not companies that make phones themselves. It's the companies that are hired by the companies that make phones, right? So it's kind of this chain of, uh, of companies. Um, and they are usually signed by the OEMs themselves. The apps are signed by the OEMs themselves. The apps are signed by the developer. Um, so it's, um, you know, the, the phone making company, I don't want to use the word manufacturer because it's more complicated than that, but uh, the company that makes phones subcontracts someone else and uh, asks them for some code, right? In this case, an OTA app. Uh, and then they include it in their system image um, as a kind of their code in a way, so it's signed. So we really don't have a way other than telling the OEM not to work with that company. We don't have any other uh, method of doing that. And to be honest, uh, the company can just change a name and pretend to be someone else for the next time, right? So, yeah, uh, so <laughs> we, we can ban a company from contributing to the system image, um, but it's more complicated than that because it's not as simple as we have a relationship with that company and we can just break the relationship. It's not our relationship to the company, it's the phone manufacturer's relationship to the company. Um, we can talk more about that later. Uh, a last question. Sure. Yeah, okay. Cool presentation, thank you. Uh, out of the stats you presented, um, you did not speak about the <coughs> malware you actually find before. And if you have any idea of the estimate uh, percent of malware that escapes this um, validation step. So, uh, 
No? Okay. Um, so we have two questions, actually. First one is, um, we didn't say how much malware we find. Um, and I don't have that off the top of my head, so I won't even guess. Um, I just didn't include that. Uh, the second question was how much malware we don't find. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to measure that. <laughs> How did you find it? Um, so it's, well, I can say how we kind of discovered Redstone. It's, it, it has the second part that's obfuscated that's really different from the first part. So when we started looking at the OTA apps, it stood out to us. Um, but the way we usually approach this kind of things is we try to look at apps that are particularly privileged, privileged like OTAs or uh, other apps that have lots of privileges and we are trying to go through them and find if they are having any kind of obfuscated code or weird code or additional code that's not in AOSP or that's not expected to be there. Okay, I think we're finished. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.